Welcome to Conquest Creations, and in today's video, we're going to be breaking down every single legendary legion from the Middle Earth strategy battle game. Before we get started breaking down the legendary legions, it's important to know what one is first. A legendary legion is specifically designed to represent an exact moment from the movies or the books. A good example is Ugluk Scouts. When the Orcs and the Urukai came together after kidnapping Merry and Pippin, they got slaughtered by the Rohirrim. But these legendary legion rules give you special abilities which represent the lore and the theme of that army. It's a good way to promote thematic playing while also giving it a competitive edge. Games Workshop has been releasing supplement books. Gondor at War, War and Rohan, The Scouring of the Shire, all of these have contained new profiles as well as these legendary legions. In this breakdown video, I'm going to be putting each legendary legion into one of three categories. We've got the underdog category, the good category, and the top tier category. Obviously, every single army can win in Middle Earth because it's a skill based game, but some armies are easier to win with than others. There are three legendary legions in this video that I have a very, very strong opinion on. You'll see when they come up, and the first one in our list is actually one of them. The first book that Games Workshop came out with as a supplement for this edition was Gondor at War. So let's look at those legendary legions first. To start off with, we have the Rangers of Ithilien. This is a legendary legion that represents Faramir when he kidnapped Frodo and Sam, where you can take all rangers. That means that your army can be 100% bows. In this army, you're required to take Faramir, Frodo, Sam, and Gollum. That means at low points you still have Frodo, Sam, and Gollum tagging along with you, so it's not quite as powerful as it used to be because they added that rule after. Now this army is a really, really tough one to go up against because it's got 100% bows, so if you're playing it, you run away and you shoot your enemy until they're dead. At 500 points you can field something like 35 bows, which is significantly more than any other army in the game. It's definitely a top tier, but this one is a drag to play against. We've started on a negative note. Hopefully it gets better from here. Our next legendary legion is the Grey Company. In the books, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli arrived at the Battle of Pelennor Fields not with the Army of the Dead, but with the Grey Company. Now this army is very similar to the normal Rangers army list, but you do get Anduril, a 40 point upgrade for free with Aragorn. So at low points, that free 40 points can make a very big difference, but you are limited with being low numbers because you're all hero. So this one is in the underdog tier. The next list is the Return of the King. This represents Aragorn's arrival at the Pelennor Fields from the movies. So you get Aragorn and the King of the Dead as must-haves, and then you can take Legolas Gimli and the Army of the Dead. As a part of this Legendary Legion, Aragorn again gets Anduril for free, and the King of the Dead gets Harbinger of Evil. That gives all of the enemies around him minus one courage. Now, when your Army of the Dead cause terror, meaning the enemy has to pass a courage test to charge you, and they strike against the enemy's courage rather than defense, that Harbinger makes a massive, massive difference. This army is super strong defensively because you've got defense 8 on your troops and terror, so it's super hard to charge them, and when you do, they've got high defense. And it can put out a punch striking against courage. It does have low numbers and a low fight value though. This is a great army for beginner players who want to turn up to a tournament and do pretty well. It's going to be tough to win, but you won't get smashed. It's solidly in the good tier, although I can see some people arguing for it to be top tier. Next up, we have the Riders of Théoden, representing Théoden's arrival at the Battle of Pelennor Fields. When this Legend of Legion first came out, it was much more powerful than it is now. One of the key models in it, Gambling, has been nerfed, but since then, it's still super powerful, just as powerful as it should have been to begin with. In this, you must only take the heroes that were actually at the Battle of the Pelennors. So you can get Theoden, you can get Gambling, you can get Aemer, you can get Eowyn as the Durnhelm profile here, and a few other heroes, as well as Royal Guard of Rohan and Riders of Rohan. The special thing about this Legendary Legion is that once per game, Theoden can call death. This means that every hero gets either a free heroic combat or a heroic strike. You compare that with Gambling, who's giving you a free might point per turn, and this Legendary Legion is all about resources and might. You'll have more might than your opponent. This was a big one when it first came out, winning a lot of tournaments, but since it got that little nerf, it hasn't been as popular, but it is still definitely in the top tier. Following on from that big top tier list, we have the Men of the West. This army represents when Aragorn and his companions all turned up at the Black Gate and demanded Sauron's attention. 
It's supposed to be a combination of Gondor, Rohan, and Dol Amroth. Now, the rules seem pretty cool on paper. You bring these three lists together. Unfortunately, it completely falls flat from there. The issue is that you could take all of these armies together anyway because they're green allies. In the Legendary Legion, you get immune to courage, so you're automatically passing all courage tests. And once per game, Aragorn can give everyone plus one fight value. Now, those sound nice, but the limitations of the Legion really hurt you here. Gondor, Dol Amroth, and Rohan already have great courage with a lot of bodyguard units, so getting free auto-pass courage on everyone else isn't that big a deal when if you play the regular list, you could bring bodyguard anyway. And plus one fight sounds nice, but you can't take any of the elite troops in here, so your fight three going up to fight four, when if you had the elite troops, you would have been fight four to begin with. Unfortunately, this one falls a bit flat, is the most definite underdog list of all of the legendary legions out there, and I wish it got boosted up. Hopefully, we can see it get a little buff at some point in the future, or something just to make it a bit more unique, because it's such a cool moment in the story. Next up, we have the army of Gothmog, representing Gothmog's raid on Osgiliath and eventual siege of Minas Tirith. Now, this legendary legion is all about Gothmog, as the name would suggest. In this one, Gothmog's auras are expanded to 12 inches rather than 3 inches, and he can affect other orc heroes with his standfast, so really helpful for keeping your army there to begin with. It's a really cool thematic moment, and a lot of people are probably playing this army before they even heard about the Legion anyway, so it just gives them a buff to a super cool orc general. It's solidly in the good tier, I haven't seen it smash any tournaments, but I haven't ever seen it get smashed, so I think it's in the middle where it belongs. And next up we have the Grand Army of the South. This represents the Haradrim Alliance that turned up at the Battle of Pelennor Fields. It allows you to take Far Harad and regular Harad together in one list. This is kind of what the Harad list used to be like in the old edition of the game. Now, unfortunately from my perspective, this Legendary Legion doesn't really add anything particularly special. You have to take Suladan or the Mumak War Leader, so if you were taking them anyway, you may as well upgrade to the Legendary Legion, I guess. It just means you get both of your army bonus from Far Harad and Near Harad, but you would have got those anyway, because they're Green Alliance. And it gives you an extra special rule if you have Suladan or the Mumak War Leader fighting the enemy's leader. But honestly, that doesn't happen that often, because Suladan is a pretty low level leader compared to some of the big heroes out there. And if you bring the Mumak War Leader, uh, it's cool, but it's a very different army. It's still solidly in the good tier because Harad is so powerful on its own anyway. The next one though is really, really cool. We've got the Black Gate Opens. Now this is the counter legendary legion to the men of the West. This is the mouth of Sauron when he goes out to meet uh, Aragorn the King and his companions. In this legion, you get a troll chieftain who gets plus one might, will, and fate. Troll Chieftains are already ridiculously powerful, so this is such a cool way to bring the power of your Troll Chieftain up even higher. You also get a rule that if you outnumber your opponent in a fight, you get plus one to wound. So this really, really incentivizes you to bring a Troll with a massive Horde of Orcs. This one's really, really powerful, and you play it with the Mouth of Sauron, so it's a super cool theme as well. This is one that I'm definitely planning on playing. I've got most of the models painted up for it, so you'll probably see it in a battle report pretty soon. It's solidly in the good tier. The next book that came out was The Scouring of the Shire. This was more of a mini book. It only has two legendary legions, but let's have a look at them. The first one is The Defenders of the Shire. Now, in the Return of the King book, after all of the fighting is over and the ring's been destroyed, Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin return to the Shire only to find that it's been taken over by Saruman and his ruffians. So they gather a band of hobbits to go and fight them. In this book, they added a whole bunch of new hobbit characters, and it provides you with some super cool special rules. One of your hobbit characters gives you the ability to take traps, which are a completely unique part of the game. Pretty much, you can deny areas of space and slow down the army. Now this legendary legion allows you to take twice as many as normal. These traps are 25 mil bases, usually you get 8, but this legendary legion gets you to 16, so you can control a huge amount of the board. Now also you get one warband who's able to deploy in a terrain piece coming on from the second turn of the game. This is really really cool because it helps deal with your low movement as hobbits by allowing you to start in a terrain piece that might be way over the enemy's side of the board. This is a really fun one, and I'm going to give it a solid good tier. 
The next legendary legion is the Chiefs Ruffians. Now this is the band of ruffians that went to the Shire that ended up fighting against Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin. This is led by Saruman as the Sharky profile. This is after he's been broken by Gandalf, so he's no longer as powerful as he used to be. Now he can take ruffians, and these ruffians don't need a warband leader, so if you want to, you can take a massive, massive horde of them, getting higher numbers than any other army in the game. The issue is, well, individually, of course, they are terrible, but there's a few ways to get around that. This Legendary Legion uh, gives you bonuses for your courage. They can use Sharky's Courage of 4, which is pretty decent, and there's also a character that can pay them to go into combat with his will points. And everyone gets Whips, which is a range 1 inch strength 1 throwing weapon. So, one of them's not going to do anything, but when you take 65, 70 models, you might manage to get a kill with it. The Chiefs Ruffians is definitely an underdog list because they've got nothing that can deal with even a moderately strong hero and any elite army is going to be able to punch through them without taking any casualties, but it will be a super fun one to play. And the next book to come out was War in Rohan. The next army is the Defenders of Helm's Deep, which unsurprisingly were all the Foot Rohan and Galadrim that defended Helm's Deep. Now this allows you to take Galadrim and Rohan together led by Théoden, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Haldir, and all of the other Rohan heroes. Now you get bonuses in this army for your courage if you're broken and if you're around Théoden. The Galadrim get the range of their bows increased by 6 inches, which is absolutely massive. And finally, you can use all your Rohan throng spears as regular spears, so it really helps to be defensive. I've seen this army perform really, really well in tournaments, so it's going in the top tier. The next army is Theodred's Guard. Now it's pretty similar to the Defenders of Helm's Deep where you get the rule where you can use your throwing spears as spears. You can also take Grimbold who gives you access to strength for Rohan warriors for something a bit different. And while Theodred's alive, everyone automatically passes all their courage tests. Theodred also counts as Theoden for the purpose of boosting up the Rohan warriors. So it's a really fun, interesting thematic one. It's definitely in the good tier. After that, we have the Riders of Aemir. This represents the scene where Aemir arrives at the Siege of Helm's Deep and smashes into the Urukai line. So we've got Aemir, Urkenbrand, and Gandalf the White. Now for this one, Aemir counts as Theoden for the purposes of boosting up the Rohan Riders, and Gandalf gets a once per game ability where every enemy model within 6 inches of him gets minus 1 into fight value. So this is all about going in, smashing into the enemy in one turn, and hopefully breaking them. Unfortunately, if you don't break them in that turn, you're in a bit of trouble because you don't have many more tricks than that, and Gandalf takes up a big chunk of your points. This one's in the underdog tier, but it will be a really, really fun one to play, and probably one I'm interested in building. After that, we've got the Pass of the Druidan. Now, on their way to the Battle of Pelennor, the Rohan were guided through the forests by the Wozis, a small race of men folk, men type folk, who lived in the forests and guided them through because they hated the orcs. It allows you to place markers on the table, which allow your cavalry to move through terrain with ease. So this means that your Rohan army, who could be all mounted, are still really, really mobile, even in a densely terrain board. And you must take Wozus in this list. They're really, really good 7-point profiles led by Gambrigan, but they're a little bit of a tax here, because you have those 12-foot models, so it's weird if you go all cavalry with the rest, so it's hard to find that balance with it. I've definitely seen some players claim that this list is amazing, but I'm yet to see it myself, so it's going in the good tier. Next, we have Ogluk Scouts. This is one of the most iconic scenes in the Two Towers. It's when the Orcs and the Urukai are banded together. In this Legendary Legion, if you're fighting in one combat with an Orc and an Urukai, they both get plus one to wound. It's called Animosity because they boost each other up by trying to be better than each other. This list is a lot of fun. One of my friends, Sean, has played it a heap, and I'm a really big fan of it. It's an awesome moment in the theme, and this really, really represents what it's supposed to be. You can also take Mauher's Raiders and a War Drum. So Mauher's Raiders gives all of your Urukai plus two move, the War Drum can give them plus three move, and you can march on top of that for another plus three move, meaning you can potentially move Urukai Scouts 14 inches in one turn. It's a really, really good way to keep your opponents off guard but your orcs are still moving their regular 6 inches and you want to stay together to get those synergies. It's solidly in the good tier. Next up we have the Wolves of Isengard. This represents the part where the uh, Wargs attacked the convoy of Rohirrim headed to Helm's Deep. This is led by Sharku and you can only take Warg Riders, uh, Orc Captains on Warg and Orc Shamans on Wargs as well as Wild Wargs. So you're very limited with what you can take. Your biggest hero is Sharku who's only 65 points. He's an absolute monster in game. I've used him a heap and he's a lot of fun. But 
you don't really want him to be your biggest hero. Now in this, he gets a free heroic combat every turn, which is awesome, but he's not very good to begin with, so you still got to work hard to make the most of it. You get really, really interesting scout rules, where from Maelstrom, you can deploy some guys at the start of the game and move on, or in regular move, you can move and shoot with a few models before the game has even started. This army works best at low points where there's not as many big heroes to take it out. At 300 points, it's definitely in the good tier. Anything above that, it's definitely in the underdog tier. Our next list is the Assault on Helm's Deep, representing, well, the Assault on Helm's Deep. In this one, you can't take any named characters, it's all Urukai. You get one Urukai captain who's upgraded with one extra wound and attack, so he's a lot beefier. But other than that, it's just the Siege Urukai, Berserkers. You can take demo teams and ballistas though. The ballistas get to reroll their scatters and their to hits, so they're extra powerful. And your detonation teams get to reroll their D6 to see if they blow up and to see how many wounds they do, meaning you're always going to be killing stuff with it. Now this has caused a lot of controversy because this list has been dominating overseas for a long time now. It's really, really powerful because you can counter big heroes with those siege weapons so easily and you can just take a massive horde of Urukai because I forgot to say your warband size is increased by six for all of your heroes. It's definitely in the top tier and represents an awesome moment in the theme and is a great one to start out with because you don't need any fancy tricks. You can just have a horde of Urukai, play the Surgeon New Legion and I guarantee you'll do well. Next up we have the Army of Dunland. This one really seems like it should be an army list rather than a Legendary Legion, but it's a Legendary Legion, so that's alright. You can take all of the Dunland specific units. Now in the Dunland Legendary Legion, your banners are increased to having a range of 6 inches. Now if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know how good banners are, so this is a really really big bonus. Also once per game you get the Dunlanding Warcry, which is every model within 12 inches of Thryden, your leader, gets plus 1 to wound. When your strength 4 base and can piercing strike to get to strength 5 and get plus 1 to wound, you can break an army in one turn if you're set up well for it. It's got a lot of really cool special rules. Jeremy played this in the Conquest Champions League and if you want to see how well it did, just check the video in the top corner there. And it is solidly in the top tier. The next book that came out was The Quest of the Ringbearer. The first one in here was The Breaking of the Fellowship, representing when the Fellowship was attacked by Lurtz's scouts. In this one, each member of the Fellowship gets their own extra special rule, which is really cool and it adds a lot of fun to playing them, but unfortunately it doesn't boost them up quite enough to be able to stand up in competitive games. It's definitely an underdog tier list, but is really fun if you're playing thematically and you only have 8 models, so it's really really easy just to sneak in a backpack or chuck in your pocket. Quest of the Ringbearer also had the Rangers of Athelion again. Now I already covered my opinion of them, not a fan, but that's alright, we don't need to go through it again. Next up was Lurtz's Scouts, representing the Scouts attacking the breaking of the Fellowship. This one's very similar to Ugluk's Scouts, except you drop all of the Orcs out, you keep your super fast moving Urukai, and Lurtz gets boosted up. He can call Heroic Challenges for free if the enemy denies the challenge, so it makes Heroic Challenge a little bit more usable, and once per game he can throw his shield just like he does to Aragorn in the movies, which can knock down a hero. It's really cool, it's not anything super special, but a lot of people were playing this army anyway without the Legendary Legion, so it just gives them a few extra special rules that are really, really fun, even if they aren't super good. It's definitely in the good tier and a lot of fun to play with and against. Next one is the Depths of Moria, representing when the Balrog arrived and there were hordes of goblins. Now in this you trade Moria's options of taking a lot of really cool synergy units and monster units for being much more straightforward, but it boosts up the Balrog. Along with all of his regular special rules, all the goblins around him get plus one fight, which takes you from fight two to fight three, which sometimes is a big deal. It also gives the Balrog a few extra special rules. Firstly, he can't be hit on more than a five plus by shooting, which keeps him safe from siege weapons. But he can deny that rule to light one enemy model on fire, which is actually really cool with the set of blaze special rule. Also, the Moria drum is battlefield wide and counts as a banner for the point for the purpose of scoring. So, all in all, a really top tier one, but not my favourite way to play Moria because you lose some of the fun options. Next up we have the Black Riders. These are the 9 ring wraiths all on their horses. You've got a lot of magic in this one. Usually, with ring wraiths, if you fight in combat, you lose a will point. Not in this Legendary Legion. Also, once per game, each ring wraith can cast a channel transfix for free that auto casts on a 6. Channel transfix halves your opponent's attacks and fight value meaning that their heroes definitely won't be able to kill your ring rates. 
This is one that was a bit controversial because it's so powerful. Unfortunately, it's really not that fun to play against because another rule is that if you're within 12 inches of seven or more ring rays, you get minus three courage and they cause terror. So a lot of this game, your opponent isn't really doing a lot. They're just trying to survive the onslaught of magic. Personally, I have this army painted up, but I haven't played it because it just doesn't seem that fun for anyone involved. But if you're into the theme, go for it. It's definitely in the top tier. Next up, we have the Kirith Ungol Legendary Legion. This represents the garrison of orcs and Mordor Urukai that Sam and Frodo come up against in the Return of the King. This is led by Shagrat and Gorbag. Now, Shagrat and Gorbag have a rivalry, so whoever has more kills, the other one gets a bonus so that they can help catch up. Also, you have the same rule as from Overlook Scouts. If an Urukai and an Orc are in combat together, they both get plus one to wound. Now, Shagrat's strength 5 to begin with, if he charges, he knocks you prone, and if he gets plus 1 to wound, that's devastating. The main reason you take this one is Shelob. She gets an extra attack if she's fighting against men, elves, hobbits, or dwarves, which is a very big deal because it takes her from being amazingly good to incredibly amazingly good. She also gets an ability where she can kill one of her own models to re-roll a dice in the fight phase, which is often worth it because it's so cool and you want to be getting kills with her. This one's definitely in the good tier. The next book is The Fall of the Necromancer. The first list is the Rangers of Mirkwood. This represents when Legolas and Tariel arrived to save Thorin's company from the Mirkwood spiders. So you can take Legolas, Tariel, Wood Elf Sentinels, Wood Elf, Mirkwood, Wood Elf, Ranger, Captains and Mirkwood Rangers. So you can take 100% bows in this one again, but you are very limited with your numbers because they're all so expensive. This one boosts up Legolas a bit. He gets the Knife Fighter special rule, which means that he can get extra attacks if he's fighting more enemies. This also importantly allows you to include as many Sentinels as you want with your Mirkwood Ranger army. So that's a very, very powerful sticking point for it. You also get Hatred Spiders and a few special rules if you're on Woodland Terrain, which is cool, but you don't always have Woodland Terrain, so you can't rely on it. I'm putting this one in the underdog to good tier because you're still so low models and you're only defense three on everything, but it's a cool theme and is a really fun one if you want to run around and shoot your opponent to bits. Next, we have by far the most controversial thing that has happened to this game, maybe ever. It's the Vanquishers of the Necromancer Legendary Legion. This is five models. You can take Gandalf, Saruman, Galadriel, Radagast the Brown, and Elrond. The scene from the Battle of Five Armies where they turn up to fight the Necromancer. Now, all of them get a billion extra special rules and mainly the ability to cast magic in combat. Now, I've played with this one once just to see how it goes, and unfortunately, it's just not a fun time for anyone because it's just too powerful and your opponent can barely ever charge you, and even when you, they do, you just cast magic so they can't hurt you at all. I played a whole game with this one, and I don't think I even took a wound on any of my heroes. So it's amazing at killing the enemy, but it's only five models, so you can't take objectives. You would think that balances it out, but not really, because if I come up against this one in a tournament, in a killing each other scenario, it doesn't matter how many practice games I've played or how good of a player I am, I'm gonna lose to this list. So I'm not a big fan of this one. It did get nerfed a little bit after it came out, but it really still misses the mark. It's still not fun to play against, but it's one of the controversial ones on this list. There's only one more. It's solidly in the top tier, unfortunately, because it can really break someone's tournament. But moving on to something more positive. We've got the Pits of Dol Guldur, representing the scene where Azog surprise attacks Gandalf. Once per game with this army, you can call a heroic move that automatically goes off that can't be counted. In it, you can just take Azog, Hunter Orc Captains, Dol Guldur Captains, and then just some of the normal troops, as well as the Dungeon Keeper. So you lose some of the cool, fun options from Azog's Legion, but you get a couple special rules to counter it, and you get resistant to magic. This one, I don't think is super necessary, but will be fun to play, especially if you're catching people by surprise with Azog. He also, very importantly, gets a free heroic combat every turn, which sounds amazing, but in his regular army, he gets Master of Battle. So it's still a trade-off. He also can't take heavy armor or the stone pile, so he's a bit more fragile. It's really interestingly balanced, and I'll put it in the good tier. And the next one is the Rise of the Necromancer. This one is Sauron the Necromancer with the nine Dol Guldur Ringwraiths and the Dungeon Master. The exact scene that, where they fight against the White Council. It's a really, really interesting one with all of your Nazgul coming back to life on a 2 plus every time they're killed. Uh, but it can be a bit of a grind because you can never kill anything in it. 
It's definitely in the top tier. Now this book just came out. It is The Defense of the North and I was waiting for this book to come out to make this video. We have our third super controversial list here and then that is The Army of Dale. Now Dale on its own was already one of the top performing armies in Australia for 2021 and they got a few extra models and now they get their regular army bonus but if you just take King Brand and Bane instead of Gurion your whole army gets Swarm Protector which means they're immune to courage. And I'm definitely expecting this to be top of a lot of tournaments coming up. Next up, we have the Defenders of Erebor. Now, for those of you who don't know, this book was all themed around the defense of Erebor. Well, maybe that's why it's called that. But while Minas Tirith was under siege from the Orcs, Erebor was under siege by the Easterlings. So we had King Dane as an old man with his son and the King and Prince of Dale fighting together against the Easterlings. Everyone here gets bonuses and synergies for being close to each other. If one of the other, if one of your friendly heroes is trapped, then your other heroes can call heroic combats, which is pretty cool. And your heroes also count as banners. It represents the theme well, and I'll stick it in the good tier. Next, we have the Bjornings. Now, this one was a strange one. We know who Bjorn is from The Hobbit, and he had a whole little tribe of people by the time the War of the Ring came along, because he grew his tribe. Bjornings are basically half trolls, sort of, sort of half trolls, think of them that way, and he also gets his son Grimbjorn. Now Grimbjorn and Bjorn are almost identical profiles, so men who can transform into a big bear. And in the Legendary Legion, they don't need to roll to transform. They also count as banners for their Bjornings. This is going to make this a really, really strong list. I haven't seen it on the table yet, it's pretty unique, I can definitely see this being a top tier list. Next we have the Host of the Dragon Emperor which is the Dragon Emperor, Rutabi, and the new Sorcerer Hero, as well as the rest of the Easterling list, minus Amda and Kamul. So this means if you don't take two of those Easterling heroes, you get the Black Dragon upgrade for free, which is a two-point upgrade normally that gives you Courage 4 and Fight 4. So this is a big deal. The Dragon Emperor also gives you an extra plus one fight if you're within six inches of him. So you got Fight 5 Easterling pike walls running around. This one's going to be really, really strong, and I think it's kind of superseded the Easterling army list in itself. I can't see people taking Amda and Kumul very often anymore, because this is just a much, much more powerful build than the regular Easterling army. It also has the regular Easterling army bonus in it. I'm expecting this to be a top tier, because Easterlings were already a top tier army, and now they've got a full bonus of a bunch of new releases and a bunch of new super powerful models. So, top tier it is. I'm expecting to see this one at a lot of tournaments coming up. The next army is the Fell Beings of Mirkwood. This is led by one of those new Orc Captains and it allows you to take Orcs and the Dark Denizens of Mirkwood together so you can have a Spider Queen and Orcs together in the same list. This gives you Woodland Creature, Hatred Elves, and it gives your leader Razgush, plus one fight against Elves. If you're playing this, it's pretty cool and it's still in the good tier. Now the last one is a really interesting one, completely unexpected. It's the Assault on Lothlorien. While Minas was, Tirith was under siege and Erebor was under siege, so was Lothlorien from a collective of orcs, goblins, and monsters. In this one, you can take all of the casters. You can take the new caster, I think it's Mazgush, the orc shaman. Uh, you can also take Ashrak from the Morialist and Druzag from the Morialist, who boost up monsters. You can also take Wildwog Chieftains, Spiders, Batswarms, uh, Wog Marauders, Goblins, and Orcs in the same army list. You get plus one to wound if you outnumber your opponent in a fight, so you want to take a lot of soldiers, but you also want a lot of beasts. This one's really, really cool. You can reroll all failed casting rolls, so you'll pretty much always get your spells off, which is fantastic. And maybe the biggest rule is it's always nighttime when you're fighting with this army, which means that shooting is reduced to 12 inches, but does get plus one to wound if you hit. The important thing is, if you have Cave Dweller, you ignore this. So you can take all your Moria guys who have Cave Dweller. This means that pretty much your enemy's shooting is limited to 12 inches, and your shooting is normal, but you get plus one to wound with your Goblin Archers, making Goblin Archers one of the most efficient models in the game. This is definitely a top tier list. And that's the last one. So that has been all the Legendary Legions broken down. Thank you for watching.